we know from our study of power spectral density of the binary modulated signal that in order to increase the bit rate, we require to increase the bandwidth of transmission. Now, it is always desirable in digital communication to increase the bit rate without increasing the bandwidth. There are modulation schemes which achieve this goal and the straightforward extension of the binary modulation scheme which provide higher bit rate without increase in bandwidth are QPSK quadrature phase shift keying, offset QPSK, MSK which stands for minimum shift keying. We will start our study with QPSK that is quadrature phase shift key. So, the bandwidth efficiency modulation schemes basically form a class of MRE modulation in general which we will study later on. So, the basic idea behind QPSK exploits the fact that the two carrier signal cos 2 pi f c t and sin 2 pi f c t. These two signals are orthogonal over the interval 0 to t b when your f c is chosen as k is an integer by t b. So, just as in analog communication, this can be used to transmit two different messages over the same frequency band. So, to accomplish this, the bit stream is taken two bits at a time and mapped into signals as shown in the following table. So, bit pattern 0 0 is mapped as m 1 0 1 as m 2 1 1 as m 3 and 1 0 m 4 and for this messages the choice of the signals are given here. So, m 1 and m 3 are polar signal with the carrier as cos 2 pi f c t and m 2 and m 4 is again polar signal, but the carrier is now sin pa 2 pi f c t and corresponding to this the waveform would be as shown in this figure. So, this is cos 2 pi f c t corresponding to the bit pattern 0 0 or uh, message m 1 this is for m 3 this is m 2 and this is m 4. So, since each bit in the original sequence occupies t b seconds, the signals corresponding to the symbols or messages last for a symbol duration which is t s equal to 2 t b seconds. Now, we define what is known as baud rate that is message or symbol rate as R s and this is equal to R b by 2 because T s is equal to twice T b. So, since bandwidth is proportional to R s, it can be reduced by half for a given bit rate R b. Conversely, for a fixed bandwidth, the bit rate R b can be double. Okay. So, now though the bit rate has been increased without a corresponding increase in bandwidth, it is also necessary to look at what happens to the bit error probability and we will examine this issue. So, to accomplish this the signals S 1 t, S 2 t, S 3 3 and S 4 t 
as represented by this message or signal set have to be represented as usual by an orthonormal basis set. Now, note that the signals in the message signal set S i t the energy in that signal will denote it by E and this two signals sin 2 pi f c t and cos 2 pi f c t are orthogonal. Given this conditions the only two orthonormal basis signals needed to represent this four signals can be derived very easily and they are as shown on this slide phi 1 t which is the normalized version of the signal s 1 t and phi 2 t which is the normalized version of the signal s 2 t. Both of these signals are orthonormal. For this orthonormal basis and for the given message signal set the signal constellation will be as shown in this figure. We have phi 1 t axis phi 2 t axis and using this as your basis signal s 1 t s 2 t s 3 3 s 4 3 can be represented as vectors in the signal space diagram. So, this is the signal constellation which we get for the q p s k signal. Now, let us determine the optimum receiver for this. So, we assume that all this four signals are equiprobable and we have additive wide Gaussian noise channel 0 mean noise process with the variance as italic n by 2 as usual. So, for this we know from our earlier st study that we can use the maximum likelihood detection rule and if we deploy that rule let us see how do we generate our optimum receiver. So, the first thing we do is basically take your receive signal R t and since our basis signals are 2 in number our signal constellation is 2 dimensional. So, we project R t onto the basis signal phi 1 t and phi 2 t to generate 2 components of this vector R as R 1 and R 2 and similarly for each of this signal S i t we can generate the message or signal vector with the 2 components. This is the component which is projected on phi 1 t and this is the component which is projected on phi 2 t. Given this now we know that the optimum receiver which minimizes the probability of error is ML detector and it says that choose that signal S i t for which this condition is valid. That is basically we are trying to calculating the equivalent distance between the received or observed vector and the message vectors. So, this is basically minimum distance receiver. Now, we can expand this quantity and if we do that we will get this expression out here. So, choose S i t if this is the smallest. Now, further expanding this expression and collecting the terms together we get this 6 terms. Note that this is the energy in the received or observed vector which is constant for any transmitted signal and in our case this is the energy in the signal which is equal for all i equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 
when we try to compare this expression for different i's, this two quantity remains the same. So, this rule can be modified now as choose s i t if this is the largest. So, if we do this basically, then we get the following receiver. So, we have RT, we have two basis signals, we project that using the correlation receiver, we sample it at appropriate time to get the two components of the observed vector R1 and R2, and we have the templates for the message vector, we take the dot product of the receive vector with the message vector and then choose the largest. This is how we generate the optimum QPSK detector receiver or demodulator. Now, having done this, let us look at the calculation of the probability of errors for this. Now, to do that, we need to first look at the decision regions in the signal constellation. So, this is the signal constellation, these are four points here. Now, you have to partition this space into four regions corresponding to the four message vectors. Now, since all of these are equiprobable, the region between S 2 and S 1 will be the perpendicular bisector joining the line S 2 S 1. Similarly, the region between S 4 and S 1 will be partitioned by the line which is perpendicular to the line joining S 1 and S 4. So, this is the sector that is the region 1, this is region 2, region 3, region 4. So, whenever your receive vector lies in this region, this would be R 1, it would be decided in favor of signal S 1 and if it lies here in this sector, it will be decided in favor of S 3. Right? Now, to calculate this probability of error, what we will do is basically, we will use the principle of rotational invariance which we have studied earlier. So, the philosophy for doing that is as follows. Remember all this are equiprobable S 1, S 2, S 3, F 4. So, all these regions basically have equal probabilities. The, the, what I mean by that is that what is the probability that the observe vector falls in this region, that probability will be same as the probability of that vector falling in this region or this region or this region. So, because of the symmetry and equal a priori probabilities of four signals, probability of error for this receiver would be the same as the conditional probability of error when you transmit any one particular signal. So, this is what I mean. So, this is the conditional probability of error given that I have transmitted S i t. So, in this case S i t being equiprobable, the probability of overall error is the same as this. And to calculate this, this is same as 1 minus the probability of correct detection given S i t. So, the probability of the vector lying in this region is the probability of correct decision given that I have transmitted S 1 t. Okay? Fine. So, what we will do that we will try to calculate the probability of correct decision given S 1 now, in order to do this, we require to find the joint 
PDF of the two components of the vectors R1 and R2 given S1T and that has to be integrated in this region R1. So, to do that what we will do is we will change this coordinate axis and rotate it. So, if we take this axis and rotate it by 45 degrees if I rotate by 45 degrees I get new coordinate axis like this. So, this is your new coordinate axis. So, in this new coordinate axis your receive vector with the components R1 and R2 can be projected as R1 dash and R2 dash. So, if we do this what we are doing is as follows you have this new coordinate points for the receive vector in terms of the, the old coordinate points of the receive vector through this transformation matrix. This transformation matrix remember is orthonormal you can easily show this. So, based on our principle of rotational invariance the probability of error which we calculate now should be the same as we get in the earlier case. And we have also seen that the components of the observed vector in the rotated coordinate axis will have this property now it will still remain Gaussian random variable because this is Gaussian random variable this is a linear transformation. The variance will still be italic n by 2 because the variance of each of this is italic n by 2 and it is being rotated through an orthonormal matrix and the means for this will be as given here root of e by 2 and minus root e by 2. This is very clear from the figure out here. Remember look here at this point if, if I transmit S 1 T then your receive vector will be somewhere around this circles. So, I have drawn the this circle dotted circles depending on the strength of noise this receive vector will be on this circumference of any of this circle. So, now if you take this point this point gets projected in the new coordinate axis as minus root of e by 2 on this axis and on this axis it gets this point gets projected as root of e by 2. Right. So, if you look at this point as far as your noise distribution is concerned the Gaussian distribution. Now, your Gaussian distribution is going to be of something like this form correct and the mean for this is going to be minus root of e by 2. As far this point is concerned the Gaussian distribution is going to be something of this form and the mean will be located at root of e by 2. Correct. And so, given this and remember this the noise components along both this axis are independent. So, what it implies that the joint PDF of the observed components in the new coordinate axis given S 1 T will be the product of the marginal PDFs. Okay. So, given this now we can easily calculate the probability of correct detection given that I have transmitted S 1 T this would be equal to look at this figure. So, what I want that if I place my Gaussian PDF with the mean at this point I want that the thing should be lying here. So, it means it is going to be 1 minus q times this quantity divided by root of n. 
So this we have done earlier, correct? So it's very simple if you look at the way this Gaussian distribution for the observed vector will look into this new coordinate axis, we can immediately write the probability of correct detection as follows. So, this is the symbol or message error probability and not the bit error probability. Remember this please. So, please note that this is the symbol or message error probability and not the bit error probability. So, even though a message error has been made, it does not mean that a specific bit is in error. So, for example, if the receiver decides on message m2 given that we have transmitted m1 then in this case this message was 0 0 and this is 0 1. So, what it means that only the second bit has gone in error. So, to determine the bit error probability it is necessary to distinguish between different message errors and this we will do it in the next class. We will continue our discussion on QPSK error calculation and evaluate the probability of the bit error. Thank you.